Well, I was going to say what's incredible about what you're saying, Gerald, is um, on top of, you know, giving its adversaries the space to do vaccine diplomacy, on top of refusing to waive intellectual property rights and make its own vaccines more widely available to produce, the U.S. was also pressuring Latin American governments not to buy the Russian vaccine. In fact, you know, we know there was this um, report that came out from the Department of Health and Human Services, their annual report for 2020 that Brazil Wire had reported on, where they actually brag that they pressured Brazil to reject the Russian COVID-19 vaccine as a part of their strategy to mitigate efforts by states like Cuba, Venezuela, and Russia to increase their malign influence in the region. So at the same time as the U.S., I mean, this is what's so, it's, it makes it, it brings it to like a new, really almost, you know, sadistic level where you're not only denying access to vaccines to poorer countries, in the case of Brazil, a country that's had a massive outbreak, right? You're also denying, you're also using your sway over their right-wing government to deny them access to a vaccine from Russia that they can actually access. I mean, it's just, it, it, it's unbelievable to me. Maybe it shouldn't be, but, mm -hmm. but I mean, what do you think about that? <laughs> well, I understand uh, why you're quizzing this particular policy. And certainly with regard to Brazil, um, President Bolsonaro is now under investigation uh, by the parliament in Brasilia. It's the equivalent of a, an impeachment hearing. It could lead possibly even to his indictment which makes it even more remarkable that on that revealing graphic that you just displayed, that Brazil has a position similar to that of the United States of America. Now, you would think that given the horrible record with regard to containing the virus that President Bolsonaro has presided over, that he would be joining with his comrades within the BRICS, uh, particularly South Africa and India to try to loosen the intellectual property restrictions, but yet uh, his policies are as contradictory as those of his patrons in Washington, D.C. And I think that we can never mention enough the point you mentioned a few moments ago, which is that after all, at the end of the day, with regard to big pharma in the United States, that a considerable portion of their research, research is funded by we the taxpayers. So we fund their research. They produce these pharmaceuticals. They charge us an arm and a leg, generally speaking, in order to access these pharmaceuticals. And then the chief executive officers and the board make out like bandits. Uh, obviously, this is a system that is dysfunctional. But worse than that, it is a system that now is accelerating a pattern of death that is unconscionable. Mm -hmm. Mika, I, one of the things that's, that's notable, and, and I'm curious your thoughts about, I, I think, the point that Dr. Horn brought up, which is this issue of the impact on U.S. imperialism of just how it looks, what has been happening with COVID-19, what they're doing. I mean, I also wonder, Mika, the the potential impact or your thoughts about the potential impact about sort of the ideological struggle between capitalism and socialism, because, you know, there are capitalist countries that did a much better job than the United States and Brazil. I'll say that for sure. But, you know, it's, it's very notable to me, China, Vietnam, uh, the state of Kerala and India, we could look, but, you know, even Venezuela, I was talking to some of our breakthrough news team, uh, Anyone who knows me, I'm a longtime supporter of the Bolivarian Revolution. I went looking to see how many people had died in Venezuela. I myself was shocked how few it was, it's about 2,000. It's fewer than Israel, fewer than Switzerland, the most overall wealth of any country per capita, um, and they have thousands and thousands more. I mean, it just seems like such a powerful and important statement on so level. The way that Vietnam mobilized the whole country to save that British pilot who wasn't even a citizen. I mean, it does seem that this, maybe I'm being too Pollyannish, has to have some effect on people's consciousness and sort of the, the, the black hat, white hat narrative about social systems. So, I mean, it's actually interesting you raised that because I was reading about um, I'm not sure if you guys are aware, but Blinken recently had virtual meetings with 
different heads of African states. And he doesn't put on the table any kind of like, what are the collaborations we should be doing around, you know, COVID vaccines? What are the ways in which we can provide relief for the African continent? He immediately is trying to opportunistically push back against China. He uses the space to say, well, we can offer a more lucrative, beneficial alternative. And this is China who, in the last decade has been providing really essential infrastructural support um, and construction in Africa. This is the same continent that for 500 years under capitalism, barely any infrastructure, barely like three hospitals are built in Guinea-Bissau, you know, during the whole of Portuguese colonial rule. And so he uses opportunistically this like, let's push back and he barely knows anything about the African continent when he speaks to uh, people, let alone offering concrete alternatives. And interestingly, um, the foreign ministry of China on Wednesday, which, you know, has been getting a lot of slack for like, you know, uh, what, what do they call them? Warrior? The wolf warrior diplomacy. Wolf, wolf, wolf warrior, <laughs> you know, in, in terms of being more vocal. But in fact, um, what they do on Wednesday is they say, we invite U.S. concrete cooperation with the African continent. We invite any forms in which you can also help us to improve the lives of African people, rather than you know trying to create this exclusivity as being a more attractive or um, you know a better option, which is essentially what the U.S. did. And this is the same U.S. that let's not forget continues to have the biggest you know foreign military presence on the continent, um, continues to use you know the kind of uh, Ex religious extremism to basically ramp up its presence in different parts of West Africa and the Sahel um, that continues to support, you know, the French um, foreign military presence in places like Niger, where there's very key um, mineral resources and uh, energy resources in terms of uranium. So I think when we are thinking about this kind of war of ideologies, let's even, if we even take take it a step back and say, we're not saying capitalism versus socialism. Let's even say basic like multilateral relationships and bilateral relationships that are improving the concrete lives of people. China offers a better alternative. It's as simple as that. They do it on our terms. They, they do it with concrete material things that benefit us and that we can see with our eyes. And like the decades of like structural adjustment programs and like the, the fact that all the conditionalities that come with those programs um, have completely like underdeveloped the continent. Dr. Horn, I'm curious your thoughts on the same question. Well, I'm happy to hear that the question of US foreign policy in Africa has been broached because it's not just the immediate issue that we're discussing, which is the question of vaccines and to what extent they will be distributed widely in Africa. It's also the malign and malignant policies that US imperialism has pursued historically on the continent that has weakened these countries, making them more susceptible to being ravaged by various maladies such as the coronavirus. It's not just the question of structural adjustment as pursued by the International Monetary Fund, which for oh so many years forced the public sector in Africa, particularly the health sector, to be downsized, but it's also the covert and overt foreign policies uh, for example, Mozambique, a neighbor of South Africa, came to independence in the mid-1970s under the Frelimo government that was trying to pursue a policy of socialist orientation and non-alignment. But alas, in the mid-1980s, the founding father of Frelimo and modern Mozambique, Samora Michel, was killed in a very mysterious airplane crash, his plane directed into a mountain in South Africa. And of course, there was likely collaboration between Washington and apartheid Pretoria. And since that time, Mozambique has been softened up, so to speak. And now there is a, an insurgency of religious zealots in the north of the country. Interestingly enough, there are credible news reports that suggest that US allies amongst the Gulf Arab states are quite involved in supporting these religious zealots who specialize in beheading children and as a result, you have a kind of humanitarian catastrophe unfolding in northern Mozambique. And that has caused many of the regional neighbors to consider 
intervening on behalf of the Maputo government, but that probably or could lead to retaliation in Harare, in Windhoek, and in other regional capitals. You see a similar policy unfolding north in uh, what is now Chad. I'm speaking of Idris Deby, the leader who was killed just a few days ago. Chad has been an essential prop in French neo-colonial policy, helping to fight, it is said, religious zealotry that in some ways uh, France and the United States helped to whip up in the first instance. It reminds me of U.S. imperialism's policies in countries like Libya, where they overthrew the government in 2011, or in Iraq, where Saddam Hussein was toppled uh, 15 odd years ago. And then after toppling the government, you see corporations like uh, Bechtel and Halliburton uh, come in to pick over the carcass. So this is the hydra, multi-headed hydra that we're now confronting with this vaccine or the failure to distribute vaccines being one only one aspect of a disastrous and catastrophic policy. It, I mean, it, it, very well taken point. I, I mean, it, it really is something, Ronnie, to even think about that, just taking a step back, that the so-called war on terror from the United States has unleashed so much around the world. Yeah, and I think it's just so interesting to juxtapose that the sort of um, the sort of tactics that China uses with its relationships with these countries and how it gets portrayed in the US media as being something really sinister and like China is going and building things in Africa, how right? Like it. it's really scary. Um, but then to hear that, you know, position of well, actually like building things is good. And, and, you know, you can see the difference uh, between what the U.S. does and what China does. It is very different. There's a difference between bombing things and funding people and, and, and arming various militia groups and the destruction that causes versus building a road or building a power plant or, you know, building a train, you know, a train track or whatever it is that China is working on when it comes to development and also doing it without these conditions attached of like, okay, well, if you want us to come build infrastructure, then your economy has to work this way or we won't do it. And we're also going to put you in like decades of debt that you can't get out of. Um, and so it is interesting to see those two things uh, juxtaposed and then also to see the way that that's played out in this pandemic where there has been, I mean, if you look at, you know, you mentioned the wolf warriors, you know, if you look at the way the U.S. portrays what China's doing, and has been portraying it, it's been portrayed as something negative that China and Russia or Cuba, for example, would be sending doctors around the world. That's 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 portrayed as something really uh, insidious and evil. And whereas like, you know, and, and the U.S. actually, in fact, did per or did try to pressure countries from accepting Cuban doctors. Uh, they pressure. They, I believe they pressured Panama. Um, to not accept Cuban doctors during a pandemic when they desperately needed the help. Um, I also just wanted to uh, also add something Please. else sinister that these pharmaceutical companies have been doing. And I'd love to get your all's reaction to this, which goes along with this issue of imperialism uh, through these pharmaceutical companies. Um, this is just one example is this is from the New York Times that Pfizer has reportedly not only sought liability protection against all civil claims, even those that could result from the company's own negligence, but has asked governments to put up sovereign assets, including their bank reserves, embassy buildings, and military bases <laughs> as collateral against lawsuits. Now, as somebody who lives in Lebanon, I can say that this did, in fact, th this um, liability protection did did slow down the ability of Lebanon to procure Pfizer vaccines because there was a debate inside the government of whether or not they wanted to allow Pfizer to have this liability protection. And this has taken place in other developing countries around the world. But I mean, I'd love to get your thoughts of that. Maybe you, Michaela, first of just like what this means is this liability protection and not also forcing these developing governments to put up their sovereign assets as collateral to be able to procure this vaccine? Honestly, I mean, when I read that headline, it was like, once again, the sheer audacity of the US to be, I mean, 
in the case of their accusations to China, another example, this is one of the things I'm interested in is China and Africa. So <laughs> is that they constantly are accusing China of debt trap diplomacy and accusing them of seizing sovereign assets, which hasn't been the case. Um, and the example they tend to cite um, in, uh, I think it's a, I'm blanking, but it's a Sri Lankan port. It actually was decades of issues around funding where they couldn't actually resolve paying back loans that they ended up having to lease it to China because they needed the help, they needed the funding, that they would have the audacity to, without any fear, just <laughs> make people do the same thing. The kind of accusations they throw around, yet somehow it's okay when they do it because they have, you know, the kind of moral higher ground, they have the ideological higher ground, all those different things. So, I mean, honestly, it, it blows your mind, the sheer audacity, and it makes you really think about how we really have to make this serious front against this because in developing countries, the sad part of it is we already have for 200, 300 years sold our sovereign assets through the colonial period, right? And the kind of post-independence, flag independence period generally was no better because you often had to put up collateral in order to get, you know, minimum capital investment so you could re-export all the goods you make back to um, the global north. So, I mean, it's, it's, it's crazy and we really do have to find a way to fight back against this. Dr. Horn. Well, this obviously is an example of what has been characterized as disaster capitalism. Uh, that is to say, seeking to capitalize upon a crisis by profiting even more handsomely. It's also, as has already been suggested, yet another example of why we must point to Washington and say, physician heal thyself. What I mean is, is that at the same time that Washington points the finger of accusation at China with regard to all of these accusations uh, concerning debt trap diplomacy and all the rest, uh, you see Washington actually practicing it. And so as the saying goes, they point a finger at China and have three fingers pointing back at themselves. Hmm. But I think what we need to realize as well, and this is something that we're really going to have to think about very deeply and carefully, is that the correlation of forces globally uh, may have shifted to the advantage of the People's Republic of China and its allies. And we may have to consider that, for example, when Mr. Biden speaks about a stronger role of the state uh, turning his back upon the policy of Ronald Wilson Reagan and a good deal of the U.S. ruling class with regard to government being the problem, uh, this may be a forced march, if you like, in response to China's strong state and US imperialism feeling that the only way it may be able to keep up is seeking to emulate the People's Republic of China in its own narrow way, of course. And certainly if you look at this policy of US imperialism today, which is seeking to, as they put it, repair the uh, frazzled alliances supposedly shattered by the 45th US president, Mr. Trump, it's not going to be easy. I mean, if you look at the European Union, for example, which is going to be essential uh, to this alliance uh, strategy of Washington, you see that for years now, the Eastern European members of the EU uh, have been meeting with China on a regular basis in the 16 plus one alliance. And then there has even been some talk, believe it or not, that Germany, uh, which has China as its major external trading partner, that is to say external to the European Union, that there is talk now about Germany, uh, which gets a good deal of its energy from Russia, uh, aligning more closely uh, with uh, Moscow and Beijing in a sort of uh, Berlin, Moscow, Beijing de facto concord, which would obviously uh, upset the apple cart in Washington, and if that happens, you'll see U.S. imperialism become uh, ever more desperate. You already see how they're harassing uh, Chinese vessels in the South China Sea. Although, keep in mind that in recent war games practiced by the Pentagon, by which are obviously stacked in favor of Washington prevailing over China, in every war game that they practice, China has prevailed. So this may be a very propitious moment 
for an offensive by anti-imperialist forces, not only in the United States of America, but I would say globally, if in fact Washington and U.S. imperialism is on the defensive as it appears to be, and certainly pushing back aggressively with regard to vaccines uh, may be a very useful place to start. I think that there's so many inflection points coming up, you know, recently that'll show us that in, in many ways. I'm, I myself am looking very, I think the next German elections are going to be very interesting. I mean, the Green Party now trying to position itself with this pro-U.S., anti-Russia, anti-China democracy rhetoric. And of course, the CDU, well, long history of being for closer relations with Russia. So it seems like they're going to try to make that the, one of the biggest issues in the German elections. It'll also be a big issue in the French elections. I mean, there are just so many different elements of this. The world is changing in such a, an unbelievable way for maybe good or ill, but the struggle will determine it. We could talk all night. We literally could talk all night. Uh, Y'all are some of the best guests we've ever had on the show. I really appreciate you. I uh, appreciate you coming back, Dr. Horn. But Mika, Dr. Horn, really appreciate you guys joining us here on the Freedom Side. Thank you. Awesome. I hope I can be a repeat offender like Dr. Horn. Yes. We will absolutely. <laughs> now you've actually written your own epitaph. You've asked to come back, yeah. and now we'll never leave you alone. We're gonna you make made you a mistake, wake up in the middle but of the I appreciate it. Do this again. <laughs> right awesome. on. Thank you. Thank you, guys.